officially open. This is draft season brought to you by Moody's. Decode risk, unlock opportunity. Visit Moody's.com to learn more. I am John Schmelk, joined as always by Tony Pauline. You can find all his written words at Sports Kita. Tony, we are about two weeks until night one of the 2024 NFL draft. Busy show next two weeks. We have our top 10 rankings at each position on offense this week. Next week, we'll do defense. Then we'll have two shows on the Monday and Wednesday of draft week, um, trying to figure out our final mock and just talking about the latest news and everything you're hearing. Those shows, uh, at least the first one, will be a little bit shorter, but we'll get two for you that week. Then we'll have all our draft reaction as well. Uh, so are you, like, sleeping at all at this point, Tony? Mm. Or, or are you surviving? I know this is basically, like, the sprint to the finish for you. And as a decathlete, you know what that feels like. There you go. Neither earthquakes nor eclipses nor volcanic eruptions on Twitter can stop us, can stop me right now because it's it's all forces moving forward. So, you know, it's kind of it's actually kind of a downtime in the sense that all ninety nine point nine percent of my film work is done. The teams are going through final draft meetings now. So it's talking to people when you can and when they're willing to talk to you to see you know, exchange information, exchange opinions. So yeah, it, it'll it's going to get kind of crazy the end of this week when the draft meetings end, and then uh, everything starts to come to the forefront. The hay is in the barn, as the expression go. goes, right? So uh, there's not much more extra to do. Unfortunately, you know, you do this all year round. I kind of jump in on a late. I still have some work to do on the defensive guys. I'm in pretty good shape offensive. I'm happy with where I'm at, uh, but I have some work to do over the next week. But it should be fun. Uh, not really pro days left, Tony, but guys that have been doing their workouts who were hurt previously in the process. Uh, Cooper DeGene from Iowa worked out on Monday, and as most everyone suspected, his workout was pretty phenomenal. I mean, I didn't think it was out of sorts. I mean, you know, he ran. It was a good workout. He ran in the low four fours. I think the fastest time that I heard was four four three. I think a thirty eight inch vert. I think a ten what ten four broad. I mean, those are good numbers. Those are not Olympian-type numbers. I think the biggest thing that I've gotten from talking to people who were there and really talking to people about the gene over the past uh, 24 hours is you're starting to hear more and more that people believe he's going to end up as a safety. They don't think, you know, they're going to try him at cornerback first. They'll attempt to see if he can play the position. But more and more people start to believe that he will end up as a uh, as a safety in the NFL. And, and I – Completely agree with that. I mean, as we've talked about in the past, to me, he's a little bit stiff. He's more opportunistic rather than a guy who's got great ball skills. He's better facing the action, the size. I mean, I, I think, and we talked about this, uh, I, I think, uh, when, when we had the guest on from PFF back in uh, October or so about the gene potentially being moved from cornerback to safety on Sunday. Yeah, and, and he did not do the agility drills, which I know some people are like, well, red flag, to your point, that maybe he's a little bit stiff. So just something to keep an eye on moving forward. But uh, we'll see if he can get into that back end of the first round. My guess is that he will, but we'll have to wait and see when we get uh, to draft night on uh, Cooper DeGene. All right, let's do our top 10s on offense here, Tony. And then we have some questions that we got from uh, Twitter as well that we'll get to. Let's start a quarterback here, and this shouldn't be a surprise if you listen to the show much. You have Caleb Williams as your one. I don't know how much time we have to spend on that. We've talked about Caleb a ton, but you can give us your little, you know, uh, thumbnail on him. And then you have Daniels over May in terms of two and three. And then you have a little bit of a gap after that before you get down to McCarthy. So why don't we get into that top three and why you have him ranked the way you do? I think Caleb Williams is the most dynamic. I think he's got a little bit of downside risk to his game. But as you like to say, the off-platform throws, the ability to improvise, He's done it with a different set of receivers the past couple of years, even going from Oklahoma uh, to USC. He's done it with completely different receivers, and he's been very productive. Struggled a little bit at times last year, but it was a one-man show at USC. Um, as we've talked about in the past, you know he's going to have to learn to go from being an arm thrower to really learning to throw in the pocket and using his legs and uh, with proper footwork. That could be the downfall. But we'll see what happens. As far as Jaden Daniels is concerned, I've said time and time again, I think Jaden Daniels could turn out to be the best quarterback to come from this year's class. I mean, the guys played better and better and better the past year and a half. I mean, he's just constantly improved. 
Yes, he had real good weapons at LSU, but he also made them very productive because of his play. He's smart. He's not reckless. He protects the football. He sees the defense. He makes all the throws. He uses all his weapons. And the reason I had him ahead of Drake May, you know, October, November, I was kind of, ah, I, I don't think Jet Daniels is better than Drake May. But when I watched the film, I saw the improvement, which you did not see from Drake May. I mean, May's got great upside. He's got an NFL body. He's got a big time arm. He makes good decisions. He can take a pounding. But it always concerns me when a quarterback basically played his best football a year ago and then enters the draft, as opposed to, say, getting a guy like Jaden Daniels who's on the upswing of his game. And that's where we're at with Drake May. Yeah, this reminds me of the way people talk about Will Levis last year a little bit, right? And Maybe. people say, oh, May is dropping and falling. I don't buy that. Um, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if teams that want Drake May are putting out, well, yeah, Drake May is not playing well, so he may be slicing them in the draft, right? Well, but, you know, to me, I think I agree with that, but I also think the situation around Drake May was completely different than Jaden Daniels, right? Like, if you swap them and you put May with LSU and Daniels with May, and I have May ahead of Daniels, I have May 2, Daniels 3, and I, and I feel pretty good about that. I feel like you would have a people would have a very different evaluation if you were to see Daniels behind that North Carolina offensive line with those weapons and you got to see May behind what's a great LSU offensive line. They're going to have two offensive tackles that are going to be, I think their left tackle is going to be a top 10 pick next year, right, Tony? He's a really good player. And those receivers that they have on LSU. I, I don't disagree. And I think that part of May's problem was he tried to do too much as the team yeah. was crumbling around. But there's absolutely no doubt about it. But you just can't dismiss, in my opinion, how outstanding Daniels was not only, you know, in 2023, if some people go back and they watch our 2022 uh, podcast, we were talking about how poor he looked in the beginning. And then he really turned it on from midseason on. It seemed that Alabama game when uh, they won in overtime because he ran that he ran the two point conversion in. It just seems like he's been on a constant upswing. And I just see so much great improvement in his game. You can say that Derek May, Drake May has better upside. There's no doubt about it. But uh, J Jaden Daniels, and, I, and it's probably because I was not a big Jaden Daniels believer, but I think from where he was as a freshman at Arizona State, where he was more athlete than passer, to where he is today, I, I just love the entire the entire package. Yeah, look, I, I'll just say this, and uh, I love Drake May. I think his upside, to your point, is off the charts. His ability to move around, throw on the move, avoid the rush, I think his instincts are good. He has an NFL arm. He's willing to throw it to the middle of the field into small areas, which you have to in the NFL. I think he's good at all of that. Daniels, I'll say this. His accuracy is better than Mays. Um, he's a more accurate and consistent thrower of the football. I don't think he has as big of an arm. But his touch and accuracy on deep balls is phenomenal. You know, those slot phase he throws are great. Obviously, he's a faster, more explosive runner than May. But I think May is maybe a little bit better at avoiding the rush and throwing off scrambles while Daniels, I think, tries to run off of his scrambles a little bit more than May does. So those are the two things that I think for me separate him. And I think May throws over the middle a little bit better than Daniels does. But look, I have both guys, Tony, as top 10 picks on my board in terms of grades. I would be, I think any team will be thrilled to get either one of these guys. And I think you're right. To me, Daniels, because of the, the baseline accuracy and his speed and athleticism has a higher floor. But I think Daniels with some of the high end throws he makes probably has a little bit of a higher upside. And just he, he he gets it between the ears. He protects the football. Yep. He doesn't make reckless passes. Uh, and, and just the constant improvement in his game. He's got to get a little bit bigger. I mean, he's penciled in, but he's got. You want to see him get a little add, add a little bolt to that frame, which should come. Um, I was just blown away by his film. Up. No, understandable. And I think what he he bulked up to over two ten in his pro day. But I think most people think he played last year probably closer to two hundred or two hundred five. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that for a quarterback. And he took a lot of hits, too, by the way, when he ran. He's one of those guys that has to w watch some baseball tape and learn how to slide. Otherwise, he might not last that long uh, at, at the NFL level. All right, you got McCarthy at four here, Tony. And uh, I think Daniel Jeremiah has referred to him as an acquired taste. And I did not think I was going to love his tape heading before I started watching it. And I liked it more than I thought I did. And I thought his third and long stuff was really good. 
you know, you go in and you're thinking, all right, there's gonna be a lot of check down. He's not asked to do a lot. He's not throwing it a ton. Michigan plays defense. They run the ball. They don't take chances. But when McCarthy had to make some big plays, he did make them a decent amount of time. He just wasn't asked a lot. He never had to play from behind. You know, we talked about this with Mayo. He is this tremendous upside. I think McCarthy and teams have loved his, you know, leadership and his his knowledge, his understanding of zone co- of coverages and stuff like that. Played in the NFL system in Michigan under Harbaugh. All that is great. I'm just not sure I see the path for him to eventually become like that top eight quarterback in the league that's going to carry a team. I think he fits well in a Shanahan system. I'm not going to compare him to Purdy. I don't think that's fair. But I I do think he's going to be a good quarterback in the NFL. I'm just not sure that star power is there. Yeah, I I agree with you. I I mean, if you're going to say, well, Jaden Daniels had these great receivers, he had a good offensive line, I mean, McCarthy played behind an offensive line that went seven deep. Six of those guys are either going to be drafted or signed to P- as PFAs. They have a running back that's going to be a third round running back. They have a, a receiver that can go Roman Wilson that can go late second round. Cornelius Johnson's going to be a day three pick. But the thing is, he played within the system and he did what was asked of him. And you mentioned the big plays. You know, he was outstanding against Ohio State for two years in a row. And that is the game that means everything to Michigan, even, you know, compared to the national championship game. But I agree with you. I, I mean, and somebody asked me this uh, coming out of Michigan Pro Day about uh, his uh, McCarthy's arm strength, and I've never been a big fan of his. He doesn't have the arm of Jaden Daniels or Drake May or, or Caleb Williams. And, and as I've said before, I think you know the the questionable throws that he makes on Saturday are going to be interceptions on Sunday, and that is a concern because now all of a sudden he's going to be asked to make you know ten to fifteen more passes per game on Sunday than what he's used to making on Saturday. And, of course, there's the speed of the game. The moxie, the confidence, the way he interviews is off the charts, and that's what teams love. Um, I, I, I like J.J. McCarthy. I just don't love him. And I think as a top-10 pick, as early as he's very as, as, as early as he's likely to go, and you know they're going to throw him into the fire if a team like – it happens to get out of the top-10, which I think there's less than 1% per- chance that happens – and a team like Minnesota doesn't trade up to get him or he lands with Denver, you know they're going to throw him into the fire right away, and that could backfire on him. Yeah, Tony, if, if and I'll be honest. If I'm sitting there, and we'll talk about this in the mock draft in a couple of weeks, if I could sit and pick, and I'm Minnesota or Denver or the Raiders, I could understand that. If I think he's going to be a good, solid quarterback, maybe it, it, just on pure rankings, that's still a little rich on my board. But you know what? For a quarterback, I could understand putting that inflation on him and then picking him there. But to pass on a Joe Alt or a Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr. even, I'm not sure I can quite sell myself and get that far. And again, I, I'm with you. I think he is a good intermediate arm. He's accurate on those, you know, straight line velocity passes, middle of the field. He throws to the middle of the field, which I like a lot. He does not a lot of touch passes, though, and his deep ball can sail. It's very flat. So I think those are some of the things when you take a look at McCarthy. Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. It, it just, just I, I'm looking at my board here. I mean, he's the 27th ranked player on my board. So when you talk about passing on the, the Dunes or the neighbors, or the Brock Bowers, or, Bowers. or the Fashanus, yep. or, or, or Jared Versus. There's a ton of players that I believe are better prospects. But like you said, you know, the inflation factor, is, which is a great term because he is a quarterback, and quarterbacks are always overdrafted. Yeah, and again, I think he's a good player. I think he's going to have a good NFL career. It's just a matter of um, when you're willing to pull that trigger versus your opportunity of drafting a different player at that point. All right, let's go to the next two quarterbacks, Tony. Let's start with Michael Penix. Talking to people that do this, I had Kurt Warner on the Giants Huddle podcast. And for you folks, if you want to hear a 30 minute conversation about evaluating college quarterbacks and how freaking impossible it is, go listen to Kurt Warner talk about okay. how a Hall of Fame quarterback says, John, I don't know how to evaluate these guys because they're not doing NFL things. So it's a great conversation. Go check it out on the Giants Huddle podcast. If, if, and we have a bunch of other really good draft spots on that as well uh, over the past couple of weeks, just talking NFL draft, not Giants stuff. If you like the draft, Go check out the John Soto podcast. A lot of great interviews on there. And Tony, he loves Michael Penix. But he's like, look, he's a pocket passer. He drops back. He knows what he's looking at. He throws it down the field. He makes big plays down the field. He's accurate down the field. And Kurt Warner sees him as that old school pocket, big arm pocket NFL quarterback. And I get it. You know, I think he does see the field well. I think he does get the ball out quickly. He's accurate down the field. He's got a big time arm. 
line drives, touch throws, every type of throw you can you can make. I love it. Here are my red flags, though, and I want to see if if you agree with me and what your additional opinion is. Um, I don't think he throws on the move very well. I think if you get pressure on him, he gets the ball out, but it's a lot of like, oh no, and it's kind of like just can he kind of flicks it out. Uh, he's a good athlete, but he's not a shifty athlete where he kind of makes people miss a lot in the pocket. And I think when his feet get unsettled, I think his accuracy does break down a lot. When he can settle in there and make his throws, I think he's an accurate thrower. But when, and in the NFL, he's not going to have the same clean pockets as he had at Washington and one of the best offensive lines in college football, right? I wonder if that type of consistency with the accuracy can stick um, when he has much muddier looking pockets in front of him at the NFL level, not to mention the medicals. You know, it's funny because you say he's a good athlete, but he's not elusive. You have to wonder how much of that inability to quickly move laterally is down to those injuries. Yeah. You know, because those if you've ever had knee or ankle or Achilles, in, you know that going in a straight line is okay. But when you start to move laterally, that's when things start to go haywire. I, I, I would agree. He's a great vertical passer. He's got a huge downfield arm. I think that the danger in watching Michael Penix with the cutups and you break down and you watch every throw of a cut up, you kind of miss the flow of the game. And one of my problems with Penix is he's very streaky. He's very inconsistent. Sometimes you don't know what you're getting from series to series with Michael Penix, never mind quarter to quarter or game to game. And that streakiness is something that is a concern with me. And you really have to watch the entire game. You can't watch the cutups. You've got to watch the flow of the game. And when he's on, he's on. Yeah. But then he'll disappear, and you'll see some of those wild throws that you talk about, and the, the offense will be stagnant. That is a big concern for me anyway. Never mind the age. Never mind the uh, the injuries. And it's not that he's an old guy. It's just that these injuries plus the age reduces the upside. We talk about the great upside that Drake May has, You know, the upside that, in my opinion, Jaden Downs has. Well, Michael Panix really doesn't have that same sort of upside because of the age, because of the injuries, because there's just not that much room physically to grow. He also doesn't throw it into the middle of the field quite as much. A lot of perimeter throws on his tape, Tony. I agree with you on that. And I think you saw it in the national championship game, right? Yeah. When you play a really good defense in Michigan, there were throws in that game that he should have made, and yeah. he didn't make it. The overthrow to... to to Adunze on the right sideline where he throws it outside. Adunze is that he spins him around and he overthrows it. And there are other throws in that game that that can be made. Now there are other throws that are really good, but I'm with you. I just think not. It's it's not it's not quite to the level of these other guys. My guess is that he's going to figure out a way to sneak into the first round. I don't know if if, if it's going to be in that top 15 area to, to 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 the Raiders or the Broncos, a team that's desperate for a quarterback. I think it's going to be a team trading back into the first round somewhere between 25 and 32 where he'll probably go. The other option would be if the New England, New England Patriots or some team that is a quarterback makes a huge move down right. to collect a lot of picks. If they make a move, move, huge move down with, say, Minnesota or something and then takes him uh, at the end of the uh, first round. You know, you mentioned that Washington game. There was also that, that pass he missed in the end zone early on, which could have helped set the tone of the game. And that's what I mean about his streakiness. That is that has been a concern for me on the college level. And it's going to be an even greater concern on Sunday football with Penix. I agree. Okay, uh, let, 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 let's roll through these last five. We spent a lot of time on quarterbacks. They're a big position. People want to hear about them. That's why we spent more time. And we'll go through the other position groups a little quicker so you're not here for a 90-minute podcast. Um, Bo Nix, Oregon, Tony. Uh, you have him as your next guy. I'm with you. Um, good timing passer, accurate in the short and intermediate range. Um, it's funny, like I watched his tape this year and he makes some deep passes down the field to, to Troy Franklin, who we'll talk about later. We both like him a lot, but I, I don't see that zip on the ball but no. that, that we saw at Auburn. I just don't know if he has that raw arm talent that you're going to need for him to be uh, ultimately a high level NFL quarterback. We didn't see it at the senior ball and we certainly, certainly didn't see it during combine workouts. Uh, and those are two big, you know, red check, red flags for me. And love Bo Nix, love what's going on between the ears, love his game management, but that's what I believe he is. He's a game manager, and that's okay. I mean, if you want to use it, you know, you talked about a Shanahan type of passer, you, you know, with J.J. McCarthy. I, I think Bo Nix fits perfectly well in that sort of timing offense, especially since he does a great job of reading and making decisions, but the lack of arm strength, it's not a vertical passer, 
And that's what a lot of teams want these days. For some reason, I just want to put him in Sean Payton's offense. I don't know why, Tony. I just want to slide him in well, there. You're right. You're, you're absolutely you're absolutely right about that. And I think that, you know, Denver's a team that <clears throat> If they, they, they don't get a, they don't get a quarterback in the first round. I could see them moving up from round two to take uh, to take Bo Nix. The problem's only they don't have a second round pick. Oh, there you go. Thank and you. it's funny Thank we've you. talked about and, and I said that before well, and I looked well, it up this week and I'm like I forgot that pick's still going in the Russell Wilson trade. <laughs> so they'll have to figure out a way. To, you know what though? The way Sean Payton worked in the Saints, they'll just trade next year's one and they'll move up in the second round to get it anyway. There you go. With the way they do it. All right, to round out your top 10 at quarterback, Tony, Spencer Rattler, Michael Pratt, Joe Milton, and Devin Leary. I like these names. I think especially uh, Rattler, Milton, and Leary, you're going for the arm talent upside. And then Pratt is more of your game manager type. Rattler, I mean, if you can get him back to where he was as a freshman at Oklahoma, you got a home run. I, at time, You know, he's the prototypical, uh, you know, at, at times he looks like a world beater. At other times he looks like an egg beater, as I like to say, you, you know, because <laughs> you don't know what you're getting from him. But if you can get a coach to put it all together from him, you could have a starting quarterback. You know, Michael Pratt and Joe Milton, it, it's like fire and ice. I mean, they are opposite ends of the spectrum. Joe Milton, uh, I mean, he, he's got a huge arm. You, you saw it during the season you, when he was at Michigan. You saw it at Tennessee. You saw it at, uh, at the combine work at his pro day. But you don't know where the ball is going half the time. And he doesn't have a lot of experience where – Michael Pratt is a thinking man's quarterback and he's accurate, but he doesn't have the arm strength. If you could put those two together, just like if you could put Bo Nix and Michael Penix together, wow, you got a top 10 pick. Devin Leary, I mean, Devin Leary has not had a very good past 12 months uh, during his time at uh, North Carolina State. He looked like a guy that was going to be a day two pick. He struggled mightily at uh, Kentucky. He really didn't rebound well at the Senior Bowl or at Combine. You know, he's a late round pick. You're going to take a roll of the dice. So, and like Spencer Rattler, try and get him back to where he was a couple of years ago. Yeah, I'm with you, Tony. Let's jump to running back here. And this is a position I don't think either one of us thinks a running back's going to go in the top 50 picks. No. And these guys, when I went through the tape this past couple of weeks to finalize my rankings, Tony, I just don't have much distance between them. Like, I'm just going to list the guys that I have in my top tier and I. There are, and I'd be okay with any one of them. Uh, Trey Dent, Trey, uh, Trey Benson, uh, Ray Davis, Jonathan Brooks, uh, Marshawn Lloyd. Will I love Will Shipley? We haven't talked about him much. I want to talk about him a little bit. Blake, Blake Corum, um, Jalen Wright. If you want a speed guy, like Ray uh, Aldrich Estime, like all these guys. Like there's not much separating them from me. It's just a matter of what type of guy you like. And, and, and I have all those guys. I do have Chase McClellan in there, although he, I'm, I'm told he's fallen a bit. It's just the order which they're going to come off. I think everyone kind of believes that Trey Benson of Florida State will be the first running back off the board, probably in the very uh, late part of round two in those closing selections. I want to and ask you then, a question about him, Tony, real quick. I looked, I, I, when I watched him, I looked at his stats. He only had more than 15 carries in three games this year. He's not an overly physical runner and powerful runner, in my opinion. I don't see how he's an 18 carry a game guy in the NFL. I think he has to be a, you know, 10 to 13 touch, 15 touch guy, and he has to pair with somebody else. I mean, he's never really carried the load before. Well, they had two really good backs at Florida State. The other kid decided to go back. They had a very average offensive line. And early on, anyway, before he got injured, the, the offense was basically revolved around the quarterback, who was an RPO quarterback, who did a lot of good things, sort of a Sam like type of quarterback. They really didn't need him. Sort of the way that Michigan didn't need J.J. McCarthy to throw the ball 20 to 25 times a game. But he's got decent size. He ran incredibly well at the combine. And he shows a lot of that speed on film. I mean, you could see that burst through the hole and oh, he yeah. beat defenders in, into the open field. I think he's got a great amount of upside. You know, you'll say, he, you will say, well, he didn't run the ball more than 15 times a game. It doesn't have a lot of carries. A lot of times that's taken as a good thing because he doesn't have a lot of mileage on him. So, you know, he's going in. He's got great skills. He's a good athlete. And he's going in, you know, with not a lot of mileage on the body, but with, 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 with a fresh body, if you will. So he's going to be able to handle more or he should be able to handle more carries physically anyway at the next level. All right. So your, your order, Tony, and then I'll intersperse a couple of comments here or there. Uh, you don't have to hit every one of these guys. We've talked about him a bunch. You have Trey Benson, one. Blake Corm, two. You've talked about Blake Corm a bunch here. We know what you think about him. Jonathan Brooks at three. Curious what you're hearing from teams about the ACL. Uh, Marshawn, Lynch, Marshawn Lynch. Marshawn, I wish they had Marshawn Lynch. Marshawn Lloyd at four, and then Jalen Wright at five out of Tennessee. So why don't we stop there? 
and give me um, a little bit of Brooks and what you're hearing about the injury and then why you like Lloyd and Wright. Well, I mean, I, I hear Brooks should be ready sometime in July, maybe ready for camp. It'll, it'll be determined this week in team meetings. You know, they'll look at the x-rays, they'll look at the MRIs. The fact is a healthy Brooks could turn out to be the best running back in this year's class, bar not, because he's got excellent size. He's a tough interior runner. He's got a lot of upside. Marshawn Lord, I think, would be a perfect fit for the New York Giants, the way he runs, the way he catches the ball out of the backfield. They didn't ask him to catch the ball that much uh, at USC because it was so receiver-centric, the way Caleb Williams uh, likes to throw the ball, but he's able to do it. He's got a, an excellent build. He's very explosive. Jalen Wright, I think, could go higher than most people think. I mean, I have him, what, five on my board, six on my board. He could actually be the second running back selected. People wow. love his explosion. Love the way he basically can take it the distance, can run the daylight. They love his speed. He runs hard on the inside. Not a real big ball carrier, but a real, but a very solid ball carrier with an upside. And we didn't talk about Will Shipley, but yeah, I mean, Shipley's a guy had a tremendous pro day workout. I think he was a four three nine, and he we he, he birded over forty inches. He plays to those numbers on the field. He's tough. He, he'll break tackles on the inside. He is a terrific pass catcher out of the backfield. I think Shipley, I've heard fourth round. I have him going in the third round. I think he could be underdrafted and it could be a real steal uh, in this year's draft at the running back class. Tony, we have never talked about Shipley before, uh, either off air or on. I agree completely. He's my sixth running back as well. Uh, I have Ray Davis. I love Ray Davis. Benson, Brooks, Lloyd. And then I have Estime and Shipley. We'll get to Estime in a second. Look, I think Shipley, he's a little undersized, so I'm not sure he's going to be a, you know, a bruiser between the tackles, but he's shifty. He makes people miss. He's a great route runner. He catches the football. This is a modern-day, three-down type of back. I, I love Will Shipley. I think he's going to be a really good pro. By the way, super productive at Clemson. It's not yeah. like this guy wasn't a really good college football player either. He was phenomenal. So uh, I have him there. Uh, let's go down the rest of your list. We've talked about Bucky Irving a, b a bunch on this show. We've talked about Jace McClellan. Though you said you hear he might not be, he might be falling a little bit. Tony, what are you hearing about Jace? Yeah, it did not, it did not work out well. Uh, just, just just not very athletic. I, when I sent these in to you, I had him as a potential fourth rounder. I'm hearing he'd go as late as the sixth round right now. Okay, and then your last two guys rounding out your top 10 is Ray Davis out of Kentucky and Audric Estime. You've talked about Estime a bunch here. I was actually thought he was, I thought he was a little shiftier than I thought he he was. Again, not that top speed, but I thought he was pretty elusive and he's powerful. Um, as for Ray Davis, you have him at nine, Tony. I have him toward the top of my rankings here. And I just think he does – I don't see a weakness. He does everything well except for maybe pass protect. He can catch it. He can run between the tackles. He can run through tackles. He's He's quick. He, you know, maybe he's not a, a Trey Benson breakaway speed, but he has a decent top gear too. I just think Ray Davis is going to be a really reliable, good starting running back in the NFL that can do a little bit of everything. I think he's more of a situational guy, four, five, nine, the combine five, eight and a half. I don't know that that, that screams feature runner to me. I think he's going to be a good, I like his skills, but I think like just about every back in this draft, except for maybe, Trey Benson, and except for maybe a Jonathan Brooks, you're looking at a rotational ball carrier. Yeah, he he isn't super explosive. You're right about that, but I, I think he'll I think he'll get you those tough yards and you know get you maybe four when you're only supposed to get two, uh, things of that nature. All right, let's continue in our rankings here, Tony. I think we're uh, we're moving along at a good pace now as we got past the quarterbacks. Don't forget, draft season is brought to you by Moody's Decode Risk unlock opportunity let's go to the wide receivers where the money is made tony we're going to do pass catchers here and then we'll briefly go through a couple other tight ends as well just because it's not a super deep tight end class and i don't want to spend too much time on tight ends like going to be day three picks so let 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 let's take this top four group and i we're going to include brock bowers in this conversation your rankings and i'm looking at the most recent ones right now you have marvin harrison jr as your top wide receiver then you have Bowers slotted in as your second highest graded guy, then Neighbors, then Roma Dunze. Then we have a bit of a gap until we get down uh, to the next player, and then we'll hit the rest of the wide receivers. So how did you order those top four and why? Well, they're very close. And I think uh, I think the three guys, Bowers, Neighbors, and Dunze, have done well in the free – draft process, although Bowers really hasn't run because of the hamstring issue. We're, we, we are recording this on Tuesday, April 9th. Bowers on Wednesday, April 10th. 
is supposed to work out for scouts, whether he does a full testing or just pass. He's definitely doing bad pass catching work. I was definitely going to run routes. I don't know that he's going to run a, uh, he's going to do testing. But the fact is, this is, as we've talked about before, I mean, he is a bit, when it comes to Bowers, he is a big tight end who plays the position like he's a receiver. He gets downfield. He creates mismatches. He gets separation. But, oh, yeah, he's big enough to get up, uh, man up against defensive backs and come away with the contested grab or come away with the tough catch in a crowd. And he's not a bad blocker. They didn't ask him to do too much inline blocking at Georgia. But when they put him in motion or when they pulled, pulled him across the line of scrimmage and asked him to block in motion, he did a terrific job. And I think, you know, <laughs> you, you look at the Kansas City Chiefs with Travis Kelsey. You, you look at the you look at the Patriots with Gronkowski. You know there is that appetite for that type of player who is a bigger playmaking, pass catching uh, tight end that just creates mismatches. Marvin Harrison is Marvin Harrison, despite the fact that he's refusing to do anything in the lead up to the draft. He is my number one prospect in this draft. He is a game controlling receiver. He's sneaky speed. Comes off a slightly disappointing season, but I think that was more so because of the play at Ohio State, uh, quarterback play at Ohio State than anything else. Uh, but he's he's a number one wideout, as is potentially Malik Neighbors. I mean, Malik Neighbors is more explosive than Marvin Harrison. He's faster than Marvin Harrison, had a great pro day. He's exceptional running after the catch. And, you know, he does a lot of things well. As I said in an article, which was posted last week, which caused a lot of mayhem. Uh, on Twitter this week, you know, there are a lot of teams that have Malik Neighbors rated higher than Marvin Harrison, but there is some concern as how Marvin Harrison would do in a big city market. There is Neighbors, concern Neighbors, that, not Harrison. Uh, I'm sorry, that Malik Neighbors may, uh, may, uh, may, how he would do in a big city uh, market. There is some concern that Neighbors may be a little bit too high maintenance. And there are some teams that have Roma Dunze rated ahead of Malik Neighbors. It's not broad rush. It's it, it's all over. The, it's you know one team. Some teams think he's better than Harrison. Some teams say say they would rather have Roma Dunze, who is probably not as game controlling as Marvin Harrison, but he's a game controller in his own right. He's not as explosive or a, a good route runner as Malik Neighbors, but he's probably you know he's very good in that area in, in his own right. He basically takes some of the best of Marvin Harrison and some of the best of Malik Neighbors, and he puts it together, and he's a very clean package. And he was a guy who, as we saw during the season, when Jalen McMillan went down with that injury at Washington, and everybody was like, uh-oh, Roma Dunze stepped up and just took over. I mean, it was the reason that fourth down play against Washington State, where he ran the reverse 23 yards, is why you know Michael Penix got to play in, in the national championship game. So all three of them, are exceptional receivers, all four of them, when you, you you count in Brock Bowers. There's no perfect prospect out there. Uh, and I, I think all four of them will be very good players. I think they will all be productive as rookies in the NFL. And I think just – and again, just so people understand, literally one hundredth of a point on Tony's grading system separates neighbors in a doomsday. That's how close he has these two guys on his board. And they're – not far away from Marvin Harrison Jr., by the way, either. There's a and little bit of a spread there, but, but not a lot. It's two hundredths of a point between Bowers and Malik Neighbors. Wow. So you got those. So you got, yeah. So you basically have four players within six hundredths of a point of each other, Tony. And those are all t legit top ten worthy picks, I mean, correct? Absolutely. I, I mean, absolutely. Yo, and, and if you dis if anyone disagrees, I'd like to know why. And, and don't tell me that, well, Brock Bowers is, is a tight end. You get a tight end later. Brock Bowers is a playmaking tight end who's been dominant for three years and, and who was just an outstanding prospect. Thousand percent agree, Tony. I'm with you. I'll just real quick on those guys, just from my perspective. Marvin Harrison, you just can't find a weakness. You know, maybe not the, the strongest yards after catch guy. I don't care. He, he's 6'4", runs like a guy that's 5'11", and runs unbelievable routes, great hands. He's awesome. Uh, you mentioned Malik Neighbor's explosive ability. He can take a 10-yard slant and take it for a touchdown on any play. Uh, Bowers' run after the catch is phenomenal. You can play him in the back, but you can play him in the slot. You can play him in line. He's not the biggest guy, but he's willing to block. Again, good hands, good route runner, really, really good player. And then Roma Dunze, again, you use the word, Tony, clean. He's a clean player. Uh, again, maybe not the most explosive guy in terms of the ability to separate and things of that nature. And, you know, yards after catch, 
maybe not, certainly not neighbors category, but not elite. But boy, this guy's play strength, his ability to adjust the balls in the air, his contested catch rate is off the charts. Unbelievable. Uh, he's a really, and he's a tough son of a gun. You know, there's no diva in Roma Dunze uh, when, when you talk to people around that program. And he played, he, he punctured a lung and broke ribs, played two weeks later. He's a tough kid. I think teams are going to love him. And then neighbors, I talk to people too, and a lot of people say, like, you know, he wasn't a five-star recruit. He was a blue-collar kid that kind of had to work his way up. So I think that appeals to people too. So, again, I don't think you can go wrong with any of those four uh, playmakers there uh, in terms of drafted in the you know top 10, top dozen picks in this year's NFL draft. All right, Tony, then you have a little bit of a gap. You have Brian Thomas. Then you have a little bit of a gap. You have Don A.D. Mitchell, Adonai Mitchell. Then you have a little bit of a gap. We'll get to your next group. So why Thomas and Mitchell next? And why Thomas ahead of Mitchell? Because I I think in my final rankings here, I'm going to have Mitchell slightly ahead of Thomas just because I think I've seen him do a little bit more as a route runner. I think Thomas is more of your deep threat, contested catch guy, uh, though Mitchell has his own consistency issues, with, with which I know you're going to talk about. So why do you have those two guys stacked up next to what you do? Oh, there you go. It's the consistency. And at times when I watch Mitchell, he looked like he was going half speed. You like to see guys when, when the play is away from him, they're they're playing hard. I didn't see and that. And Tony, he basically admitted that at the combine. He said, uh, yeah, when I knew the ball wasn't coming to me, I didn't run that hard. And, and I, you know, you, you want to see guys who work hard even when they're not involved in the action of the play is uh, away from, you know, a receiver. You, you're doing that to basically make the defensive back, cornerback think that, you know, the ball is coming to you or, or have the safety think, you know, I better keep an eye on this guy and, and distract the safety. I didn't see that. I also like Thomas, the way he basically just exploded this year. He's tall, he's smooth, he's fluid. And the fact is this, when he ran the 4-3-3 at the combine, I don't think anybody expected it. Yeah, Mitchell ran faster than, than everyone thought. But, you know, you go into the process, go into the combine, you think that Brian Thomas is a bigger possession receiver compared to Malik Neighbors. He ends up running faster than Malik Neighbors did the pro day. And you look at the size, you look at the whole package, I just see tremendous amount of upside yeah. for Brian Thomas. As I do with the Donnie Mitchell, who was a guy I fell in love with when he was a true freshman at Georgia and just showed great playmaking skill. Uh, I think, granted, Mitchell was injured in 2022, which held him back. He then transferred to Texas this year, and he was just one of a group of pass catchers that they had there with Xavier Worthy, with the Whippington kid who's going to could be a late round pick. With uh, Jatavian San Sanders, he's going to be the second tight end off the board. So there was kind of a, a you know, there was a large group there, which I think hurt his uh, opportunities. But I, I just think that really Thomas stood out this year, even playing alongside uh, Malik Neighbors. I'm with you. Then you have, Tony, your next three players are really stacked up here, all within 100th of a point of each other on your grading scale. Uh, Xavier Worthy, Lad McConkey, and Troy Franklin, basically with identical grades, more or less. Uh, why do those guys kind of stand alone in that, you know, first slash second round group and give me a little scorecard on each one of those guys that we've talked about all three, a bunch. Well, Xavier worthy is the, is the deep threat. He's the vertical receiver in, in this, in this year's draft. You know, he showed it at uh, Texas and then he goes to the combine and he runs a four, two, one. And we saw that John Ross, who I didn't think was as good a receiver as Xavier worthy, what that four, two, two did for John, uh, did for John Ross. Uh, Lad McConkey again. I mean, he's the more consistent version of uh, AD Mid uh, Donnie Mitchell, who he took over for at Georgia. He's a great route runner. He gets great separation. And like Mitchell and like Ryan Thomas, he ran much faster than anybody thought. He's not super big, five eleven and a half, hundred eighty six pounds. He's not as fast as those guys. He ran a four four where those guys are running low four threes. But he just does everything well. And he's just so consistent and he's so reliable. And teams have a first round grade on Lad McConkey. I don't know that he's going to go in the first round, but if he doesn't go in the first round, he's going to go in within the first probably five to six picks in round two. Troy Franklin, tall guy, terrific pass catcher. I mean, he he ran a four four one at the combine when he was ill. He plays faster. Bo Nix got was found ways to get the ball to him. He was very consistent at, at Oregon. Hasn't had the best uh, process in the run-up to the draft, but he's done enough, I think, to affirm himself in the top half of round two. Yet again, he's, he's a little slight, Tony, and you mentioned your little breakdown in front of me that he has to improve his play strength a little bit. I agree with that. 
But I think people, what people don't realize is, and I, I agree. I think you're. I think he plays faster than that four four one. I think he plays just as fast. If you watch his and him and Xavier Worthy's tape, Tony, to me in terms of speed, I don't see that much difference between the two when you watch them on on, on Saturdays. I, I think they're very similar, and I think Franklin's a hell of a route runner for a guy that's six. I thought did, did, I'm not sure if he got to six three, six two and a half maybe. For for a guy that size to come in and out of his breaks as well as he does and change direction. That to me is, is why he's here and not in this next group, Tony. And he's just a big play machine with a quarterback, by the way, as we mentioned earlier, it's not like he is this big, he's not playing with Michael Penix here. You know, he, he's playing with Bo Nix, which is a little bit different. And the consistency is, is what we, you know, when the ball is thrown in his direction, he's catching it and he plays hard and, and he's, he's a feisty receiver too. I mean, he's not afraid. He doesn't back down. He's not afraid of physical contact. He'll fight to come away with those contested grabs. Yeah, and I think McConkey, just a real quick, I think he's a just I think he might be the best route runner, aside from maybe Marvin Harrison Jr. in this class, though he separates and, and we saw at the senior ball, right? Like people could not stay with him at the top of his route tree. Just really, really good player. Now I like how you've stuck to your guns on this guy, Tony, because other people have seen him plummet a little bit on their boards. And maybe I've heard people talk about third round. You still have all the love for Jatavian Sanders, and you have him right in this range for the draft as well. Why, why are you staying strong on JT? Because he's a playmaker. He ran four six nine at, at the combine. Didn't run again at the uh, at his pro day. He's got excellent size. He's got soft natural hands. He wins out for the contested throws. He, he's a guy who on third and eight. He's going to be a reliable receiver for you. He also shows the ability to get downfield and make plays downfield for you. And again, I mean, he was a main cog in that Texas offense and had a lot of pass catchers. I just like he's a big, fluid guy. He could go third round. I have him as a second round. So I believe anything out of, you know, pick number 50, he's going to be a, a real big, uh, uh, excellent value. All right, I'm going to go a little bit deeper on wide receiver here, Tony, just because it's such a good draft class. I mean, we were in, we already went through eight receivers and we're not even to your second round grades yet. Yeah. It's it's unbelievable. So guys with second round grades on your board, you have Devontae Walker out of North Carolina. We've talked about him a ton. Uh, Jalen McMillan out of Washington. The love affair continues. I like seeing him in the second round. Uh, Roman Wilson, Keon Coleman, and Ricky Pearsall from Florida, all with second round grades on your board, board, Tony. Real quick, I think of the second round guys, the guys, the best chance to become like a true X is probably Walker just because of his, his size speed combination. Though he has to polish some things up in terms of route running and, and catching the ball. Uh, Jalen McMillan, a bigger guy, but I think he's more of a slot. He has some contested catch issues. Roman Wilson, speed slot, really good player, vertical slot, good player. And again, I think people talk about McCarthy having his numbers you know, brought down because of the Michigan offense. Well, Roman Wilson, same deal. Keon Coleman, I see him as a kind of more of a big possession contested catch guy. And then Ricky Pearsall, who I think can play inside and outside. He's over six feet. He tested off the charts. He's fast. He's quick. He's a good route runner too. He was so good the senior bowl. He was successful early and got the heck out of there. So uh, to me, all those guys have different roles, but can be really good players in the NFL. You can touch on any or all of them, however you want to handle it. Pearsall is one of the fastest rising receivers when I talk to NFL people that is moving up draft boards. He could potentially be a guy that's selected in the, within the first 10 picks of round two, but he's going to go in round two. And a lot of it has to do with the testing. We knew he was a great receiver, very reliable, dependable hands, very consistent. You mentioned the route running. Then he goes to the combine and he runs in the low four fours. Uh, Keon Coleman, I mean, he is what he is. He's a bit one-dimensional in the sense that he's a big possession uh, wideout, a, con a contested catch wideout. Didn't run the shuttles at the combine. Didn't run the shuttles at the three cone at uh, during his pro day, which is a concern. Ran four six one. I mean, if you get him, he is your red zone threat. He is your guy that. You know, you're going to throw the ball up to for the jump balls. He's your bigger possession uh, wideout. And Tony, trust me, if he was running those agility drills well in training, right. he would have he would have run them. Of course. And, and, you know, there is a market for that. There is a need for that type of receiver in the NFL. It's just not a huge attraction in the draft because you want the guys like the Roman Wilsons, like the Ricky Pearsalls, you know, who can separate through the routes or the Devontae Walkers who was almost six foot two and it is a vertical wideout. No, I'm with you hundred percent. All right. Just want to do a couple of honorable mentions here, Tony, just because again, it's such, it's such a deep group. Um, you have at the bottom of your list as a third round pick Jalen Polk out of Washington. I know you've, 
probably gotten higher on him as you've gone through this process on Polk. And I'll Absolutely. throw a couple other guys out there that'll probably be, you know, if not gone in the second round, then they will be third round pick Xavier Leggett out of South Carolina. Who we've talked a lot about. Um, I want to throw Malachi Corley into the mix out of Western Kentucky. Uh, he's a guy that I think showed he's a little bit more than a gadget guy at the senior bowl when he ran some more routes. And I thought he did a nice job there. Um, and those are the other guys that I think I would have on the list. You know, maybe, you know, Luke McCaffrey and Brendan Rice, maybe a further down the road type of guys. Um, but, you know, any other wide receivers you think worth mentioning that maybe people are sleeping on a little bit? No, I, I mean, we mentioned 16 of them and we're barely out of the third round. And, and, <laughs> and this, despite as well as the uh, two tight ends we talked about. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll throw Malik Washington there, too, is a very productive guy. We talked a lot about the Shrine game. All right. Uh, tight end really quick, Tony. We talked about the top two guys in this list. Um, I'll just read the rest of your top 10, and you can kind of hit on whatever kind of topics you want. Then we'll do the big boys on the offensive line to wrap things up. Uh, you have third-round grades on uh, Ben Sanat and Theo Johnson. Sanat, more of that fullback, H-back type, um, you know, versatile player, can move him around that uh, Kansas State, Theo Johnson, athletic Penn State tight end. You have Cade Stover as your lone fourth-round guy. And then you have uh, Jaheim Bell, Tip Ryman, Devin Culp, Jared Wiley, and then Tanner McLaughlin, as uh, fifth and sixth round players, Wiley McLaughlin, I know have some wide receiver or receiving upside, I should say, pass catcher upside. Uh, your overall thoughts on, on the rest of those guys in the tight end class in general? I think Wiley's a guy that will probably move up my board. As I, he's one of those guys that I got to go back and watch him because to see why I have such a different grade compared to Scout. So he's probably a guy that's going to probably move up to the fourth round. The interesting guy to watch that you didn't mention because he wasn't on the list is Johnny Wilson of Florida State. I've taught, you know, Johnny Wilson, Florida State, 6'5 and a half, 230 round, one pounds, played receiver at Florida State. I think he's got like 35 inch arms, played receiver well, ran faster than most people thought the combine. Four, and dude, five, his, and his agility was great at that height, too. His agility drills were phenomenal. But when you talk to teams, six, six and a half, 231 pounds, he's going to get bigger before he gets smaller, and more and more teams are projecting him to tight end, which is where I had him for the longest time until I saw his testing. I was like, all right, well, he should stay at receiver. But that's going to be an interesting one on draft day to see when his name is announced, maybe in the third round, maybe in the fourth round, is he announced as the receiver, Johnny Wilson, or is he announced as a tight end? Yeah, getting him in the right situation, I think, with the right offensive coach to use him the right way. I think uh, will be critical, but yeah, he to me is interesting too, Tony, because I could see him easily getting into the third round or, you know, maybe even back into the second, if a team really has a role for him, but yeah, I think he's a really interesting player. I'm with you. Draft season brought to you by Moody's decode risk, unlock opportunity. All right. Finally, the big boys, Tony offensive line. Let's get to it. You have 12 guys here that you listed. This is guard and tackle together. Then we'll kind of, you know, real quickly get into the rest of your list here. Uh, Olu Fashionu. You're st- I love Tony. This is why I love you. You stick to your guns. You still have them over Joe Alt. Get give your fashion new. Um, I'm not going to say propaganda because it's not propaganda. It's it, it's real. Uh, I'll just say this: fashion new, unbelievable pass rusher in terms of his fluidity and his pass ability protector. to pass protect. I think he's on the ground a little bit too much in the run game, to be honest with you. And that's the only thing that has me worried yeah. about him. I think his his anchor and his power will be fine. I think he'll get stronger. I think he'll be good at that. But why do you have Fashion uh, ahead of Joe Alt and those are your one twos? And I think Alt will be drafted first. He's been gone first in all my uh, mock drafts. But the fact is this I prefer those mobile, agile, Jonathan Ogden type of left tackles, the guys that can easily slide out, the guys that have great lateral range, the guys that can get out to the second level show the ability to redirect to linebackers or, or even players in the secondary, hit a moving target. And Fashano does that better than Joe Alt, in my opinion, who shows some stiffness. You said go back to the Louisville game. Yeah, he's big. He's hulking. You know, he moves relatively well. Fashano's got small hands, eight and a half inch hands, which some people have brought up. At, that's going to be a problem, they believe, because they've never been a – a very early pick at tackle that in, didn't have hands that are at least nine inches. I, I just don't know how Fashano, who was a terrific player at left tackle for Penn State on a very good offensive line, goes from this guy that people were saying was top five, top five, top five, and now all of a sudden he's a mid-first round choice. I just see too much talent there. I see too much outstanding ability and pass protection that I'm just going to fall off this guy like everybody else seems to have. All right, so I'm going to go through the rest of your tackles first. Then we'll get to the interior guys, Tony. 
You have uh, Talaese Fuanga as your third offensive tackle. And Marius Mims as your as your fourth. Troy Fautanu as your fifth. Then Tyler Guyton, J.C. Latham, Jordan Morgan um, rounding out your first-round grades. So just to count of folks, that's eight first-round grades Tony has on offensive tackles. My order is slightly different, Tony, but the, the guys are in the same group. I have Mims as my third best offensive tackle, and 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 this is the schmuck that you know three weeks ago said maybe he's a little overrated. Then I went back and I rewatched his tape, and I'm like, oh my god, the guy's a brick wall. You can't get around him in pass protection. So I have him as my third guy, right behind him, J.C. Latham. I think he's really athletic for a guy his size. He's got long arms. I have Fuanga after that, then Fautanu, then Guyton. And I believe, I, and I ended up on this, and I went back and forth a lot. I actually have Kingsley uh, Suamataia ahead of Jordan Morgan, just slightly with almost identical grades at the very end of that first round. I have one, two grades, first, second round grades on those two guys. So a little bit different than you. But Tony, if you need an offensive tackle, this is the draft to be picking between ten and twenty-five because you're going to be able to find one. Absolutely, and I mean, and then and then it falls off. I mean, there's a yeah. there's a big fall off when you get after Suamataia. Uh, who may go a little bit later than people think. I, I mean, you mentioned J.C. Latham. He moves well for a size. It's the size that concerns me. 342 pounds at the combine. He was probably closer to 360 during the season. You, you know, it's easier to block guys on Saturday and, and get your hands into them on, uh, at that size than it is on Sunday. You look at the struggles Evan Neal has had. Uh, Marius Mims, I agree with you. I mean, you know, he's not just a brick wall. He moves relatively well. He's not a fluid it was zone blocking guy, but he moves well for a guy that's big and he's got a lot of upsides. He's only started eight games. Fatano is going to be an interesting one. Fatano can be a guy that I believe goes much earlier than people are thinking. People have teams have him on their guard board as well as their tackle board. We saw him do a great job at left tackle for Washington, but he's six three and a half. Is he going to be? You know, the teams are they okay with a guy with that height at left tackle? I think it'll be a situation where. You draft him as a left tackle. The worst case scenario, you got you push him inside the guard. What I liked about Fautana, Tony, he gets his leverage is phenomenal. Yeah. He get yeah. he is such good knee bend, and he gets so low. I, I'm going to mention that with 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 one of the guard centers we talk about too. But I I, I just feel like and it, it allows him to move as well as he does because he's able to get such good knee bend. And he moves incredibly well. I mean, he is <laughs> quick out to the second level. He's able to get on the third level and, and take players out on, on the uh, in motion. Uh, and, and it's that ability to block in motion as his own blocker where is he a tackler or is he a guard? Sort of the same situation with George Morgan, a little bit taller at six foot five. There are some teams, I know, like the Baltimore Ravens think that he can play right tackle. I don't know because we saw him get run over at times during the senior bowl. But he is very athletic. He is a terrific pass protector in the Fashano mode with the footwork, with the lateral range, with the ability to get out on the second level. You can get guys stronger. I, I mean, guys like Fashano and Jordan Morgan who need, you know, becoming stronger is just a matter of being more dedicated in the weight room, getting in the weight training program. It's oftentimes impossible to teach agility, mobility, loosening up, and not being stiff which is why I put a premium on guys like Fashanu, like Jordan Morgan. Agree 100%. Then for your second-round guys, Tony, you have Roger Rosegarn and Patrick Paul. I have it the same exact way. Then we have Macklin Calvis, who's coming off that big toe injury. I had a chance to talk him down there at the Shrine game. And then uh, I've not checked this name yet, so I'm going to butcher it. Kieran, I'm a Gada J, maybe? Right. I'm a Gada J yeah. from Yale. Uh, tell me about him a little bit, because we've talked about most of the other guys in this class. Played left tackle at Yale, played four games this year before he tore a quad muscle and was sidelined. So, you know, when I was looking at him, we were th I was thinking Ali Marpet. If you remember Ali Marpet, the kid from uh, from what, Hobart. Hobart. A couple, uh, a couple of years ago who went to the senior bowl and blew it up. And that is the image I had for the Yale kid moving forward. That was done in, in, after four games. 36-inch uh, long arms, moves incredibly well. Terrific pass protector, good footwork, very unpolished. I, I think the injury really hurt his development and the inability to finish out the season in the Ivy League, then go on and perform at the uh, at the Senior Bowl and participate in the Combine. He worked out last week, and he just did position drills for a little bit of time for, for scouts. Uh, he's got a lot of upside. I think what's going to happen is he's probably going to fall into day, the beginning part of day three, but you're just going to have to harvest that talent, get him back to where he was in 2022, and just build on that. I mean, the injury should not be a problem. It was a torn quad. 
Uh, he probably could have done some testing, but decided not to because he wasn't really in that sort of, sort of shape rehabbing from the injury. But he's got great upside. And, you know, he's more like a Fashano or Jordan Morgan than he is a, a Fuega or a Mims uh, w- with his game. And let me just say, I think Roger Rosengarten and Patrick Paul both have some very good upside. Paul, I'm not sure has the is ever going to his height is going to develop the power and push that you that you want. Uh, but he's certainly athletic and he's long. And then Rosengarten, I think, is a much better athlete than people are giving him credit for. He yeah. tested well. You watch the tape. He moves well. He moved really well at the Senior Bowl, Tony. I think his his movement skills are better than some of the tackles that are ranked higher than him. Um, and, and then I, real quick, I wanted to ask you about Tyler Guyton. How quickly do you think teams think they can get him on the field? Because I do think his hand usage and stuff like that is very raw. He's got a lot of fundamental stuff. He still needs to get better. How quickly do you think teams believe they can get him on the field? And do they, do they think they can move him over to left tackle if they want to? Well, he played left tackle for a while until he lost a job at Oklahoma. I think the bigger problem with the, with Guyton is the fire. I, I mean, uh, which Tyler Guyton are you going to get? Are you going to get the guy that we saw at the Senior Bowl who was terrific? Or were you going to get the guy at Oklahoma who was benched, who lost his job at left tackle? I, I mean, it, it's a matter of Tyler Guyton should be starting by the second month of his rookie season if he applies himself. That's the issue with Tyler Guyton. Tyler Guyton applied himself and really played to the potential that he had. We'd be talking about Tyler Guyton as potentially a top 12 pick. Agreed. All right, let's go guard center, Tony. The only guy with a pure first-round grade you have on your board is Jackson Powers Johnson, the center out of Oregon. Uh, Phenomenal at the Senior Bowl. You really can't find any games during the year that, you know, he played poorly, Uh, really, Tony, even the last two years. You know, maybe the only little knock I have on him is sometimes his short arms show up and he doesn't quite extend and latch on the guys. But he's a 330 pound center that can power people. He recovers well, even when he gets beat. Uh, I think he's a, an easy all day first round pick. My understanding is there are maybe some medical things with him uh, hearing some things. But other than that, in terms of his stuff on the field, Tony, I, this is an easy first round pick for me. You would think. I mean, that's the way it should be. If it's not the Pittsburgh Steelers, maybe it's the Miami Dolphins. And he moves relatively well. We saw it at the Senior Bowl. And the fact is, is he played where most guys are bailing on the Senior Bowl because of injuries. Jackson Powers Johnson came to the inju- uh, came to the Senior Bowl, injured, and played two days, and was dominant the first day of practice. And, you know, here's a guy who went from guard in 2022, which he played well, right guard at Oregon, moved to center, was a natural at the position, has got great upside, has got terrific size. I think he's a quick starter. You know, you mentioned he's my only, he's the only guy that I have with a first round grade. I do think Graham Barton is going to go in the first round. There's no doubt in my mind. The thing with Graham Barton is he's a left tackle at Duke who projects to guard, who some people project to center. I so like him better at center, Tony. I'm not sure he has the power right now to play guard in the NFL, to be honest but- with you. But it's that projection, which is kind of a concern for me, because, you know, you're going to project in the center. The guy's really, as far as I know, hasn't taken snaps uh, in in game competition. He did take he did uh, snap during his pro day. He had the individual pro day and he looked, I'm sorry, during the Duke pro day. And he looked really good. But, you know, snapping in shorts and a T-shirt while people are watching are different when you're in full pads and there's somebody on the other side who wants to run over you. So the projection with Barton is a concern. He's got the size. He ran incredibly, he tested incredibly well, and he looked good during pro day. If he can translate that onto the field, he is going to make everyone who thinks he's a first round pick, a potential bottom third of round one choice at center, look like a genius. I, I also thought his 2022 tape was better than his 2023 tape, to be honest with you. But again, good player. I think I think he will get picked in the first round given his versatility. Uh, you have two pure second round grades, Tony Christian Haynes and Cooper Beebe. I watched Cooper Beebe again yesterday. Boy, I love Cooper Beebe. I yeah. think that's a safe second round pick. I saw him just toss some safeties and linebackers on the second level on some of his tape. That was a lot of fun. But he's big. He's strong. I know he didn't. His bench press number wasn't great. I don't care. I see what I see on tape. He's a people mover. Uh, I think he's a guy in a power run scheme that that can be really, really good. His bench press number wasn't good, but he's got 31 inch arms. So you know, yeah, the bench press number not a big deal. But when you're looking at a guy with 31 inch arms, you know, and, and, and you're right. I mean, the film is he's probably the nastiest blocker in this year. I, I mean, he's a guy who's always looking to bury people. I mean, bury them, send them to China. <laughs> you, you know, when when he get when he gets down on, and he is a great run blocker. But it's the measurables and the 31 inch arms, which is going to be a concern. Which 
you know, Cooper BB for the longest time, people, including myself, thought maybe late first round, but those arms and everything else are going to push him down into, into uh, the second round. Again, doesn't mean he's not going to be a real good player on Sunday. It's just that it's just that when you're drafting, you're looking at the film, but you're also considering these measurables. Uh, you know, go back to uh, Keon Coleman, uh, the bigger possession receiver, and that just basically reduces your attractiveness on draft day. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm with you. All right, let's go to your next kind of group here. You have Isaiah Adams as as a two three kind of borderline second round, third round guy. Zach Zinter, Javion Cohen, Brandon Coleman. I like Zach Frazier as more of a high second round pick, Tony. I think he's one of those guys. He looks like a wrestler. He's got really good knee bend. I, I, maybe the injury pushes him down for you. Why don't you kind of go through that real group real quick and, and, and why you have those guys where you do? And you could be right about Zach Frazier from what I'm hearing. Zach Frazier could be off the board within the first 10 to 12 picks of round two. There's no doubt about it. I see a guy who's smart, tough, mobile. Very good uh, on the second level, but I also see a guy that's got to improve his strength at the point of attack because sometimes he gets ragdolled and gets pushed around. Zach Zinter is going to be an interesting one. The kid from Michigan, he could go third round. He could go fifth round. It depends on what teams see in those MRIs, in those x-rays, and where they project or when they project he will be back to 100% and ready. Remember, he broke his leg in, what, the third quarter of that Ohio State game late in the season, the last regular season game, wasn't able to play in any of the playoff games. But Zinter is a, when you watch the film, he is a dominant sort of Cooper Beebe type of drive blocking lineman who moves relatively well, who was not pigeonholed as a uh, as a power gap blocker. You may be able to use him uh, in, in his own blocking system. One guy that we kind of skipped over, who uh, we I think we both have rated very early, was Christian Haynes of UConn, yeah. who was sort of in that Zach Zinter mold. When you watch Christian Haynes, I mean, he is a punch in the mouth, kind of drive you off the ball type of lineman. Then he goes to the senior bowl, runs a 5 3 and during position drills, you know, he looks like a 280-pound offensive lineman moving around the football rather than the 317-pound masher that we saw the past couple of seasons at UConn and we, we witnessed at the senior bowl. No, I'm with you 100%, Tony. Just to, to round out your list, uh, day three guys, you have Kingsley Aguacan out of Florida, the center, uh, Seteoa Lamia out of, uh, and I butchered that, out of Utah. I think he's actually a pretty interesting player. I think he's got some upside. Uh, Leighton Robinson out of Texas A&M and Tanner Bordellini, the very athletic center uh, out of Washington. So now he's in other centers too, like Bo Limmer, Cedric Van Pran comes in there, Tony. This is a pretty deep interior line class. Should be Bordellini's Wisconsin, not uh, not Washington. Oh, what I say, Washington? Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, Wisconsin. You don't want to cheese off all those Badger fans. We've got no. cheese off about people this weekend. And he uh, and, and, and he tested really well, by the way. Bordellini. Off the charts, uh, and he plays like that too. He plays yeah. like an athletic uh, zone blocking type of lineman. He's got to get stronger though, because he gets pushed around. He doesn't get a lot of movement run blocking. But again, you know, six four and a half, three hundred three pounds. You can get a guy in the weight room. You can get him to be stronger just as long as he's dedicated to it. But it's tough to teach the movement skills, to teach the fluidity, to touch, to teach the mobility, if you can teach it at all. All right, here we go. couple questions here, Tony, before we say goodbye. Um, Steven Sperry, I saw your question via email. I will get to that next week. Uh, should Malik Neighbors, Tony, be considered a slot or outside wide receiver? Either or. I, I, don't pigeonhole because you can do everything. I, I mean, you can, you can line them up in the slot. You can line them up on the outside. Uh, you're going to do whatever is best for your system. I, I don't think... He, I think he can do either or. Michael Christopher Tony, if you're the Jets GM, no paycheck, just the responsibility. Right. Um, do you take Rome or Neighbors if they're there at ten along with Olu Fashionu? Where, where do you go there? Wide receiver or tackle? If I am the GM, I am taking the offensive tackle because I I've always been a big left tackle guy. I've always been, you know, I I thought they made a mistake taking Keyshawn Johnson over Jonathan Ogden. Years ago, when they had the chance to draft what turned out to be a Hall of Fame left tackle, I'm taking for shadow. I think they take the uh, receiver, though, because they're in a win-down boat. Uh, is there a surprise pick in the top 10 that no one is talking about? I I, I don't see it. I, I mean... I agree. You, you know, I, I don't think... There's no way Penix or Bo Nix go in the top 10. I mean... Who I I I don't I don't see it. I I think the top ten we may not know the order but we know, may know the player but we know the players. All right, this question from uh, at Leffy 
What teams could draft John Reese Plum Plumley on day three, and how many snaps a game will Sean Payton give him as a rookie? <laughs> uh, you know, listen, I like John Reese Plumley. Uh, his film is terrific. I don't think he's getting drafted. I, I, I really don't. I hope he gets drafted. I don't think. I think he's going to have to make it the hard way. I do think he can make a a, a roster for uh, either a timing offense or an offense that puts the quarterback in motion. He's got a decent amount of talent, but he's small. He's been all over the place. He, we saw him at the Shrine game. He had his moments at the Shrine game. Uh, I don't uh, I, I don't think he's going to get drafted, though. At, at Lardude 74, Tony, uh, which offensive tackles do you have confidence that can play left or right yes, that right. you could draft in the first round? Yeah, well, you know, we talked about Tyler Guyton. Uh, that, that would be a possibility. Some te- I don't agree with it, but some teams think that Jordan Morgan can play right tackle. Uh, and, and that well, Joe Alt, obviously, I think Joe Alt, uh, you, you know, can play left tackle, but I also think he would be a terrific right tackle. So those three guys: Joe Alt, uh, Tyler Guyton, if he gets his acting gear, and not my opinion, but uh, Jordan Morgan as well, and then of course Kingsley Suamatea, who played both positions incredibly well for BYU. Good one. His, his second part of this question, what second round wide receivers are smart enough to earn Aaron Rodgers' trust and find a spot on the offense in year one? Uh, are we talking about receivers or are we talking about Aaron Rodgers here? So uh, second round receivers, I would like Jalen I like Jalen McMillan a lot. I think Jalen McMillan fits that mold. Uh, you, you know, he's explosive. He's quick. Land McConkey is not going to fall down that far. So and remember, I don't it. think Tony, you're covering it wrong. I don't think the Jets have their own second round pick, right? No, they've got the second one, which I think is like 49 or something like that. So that's that's what I'm thinking. That's why I say he's not going to fall down. I would say Jalen McMillan, which which like his with his ability to separate uh Keon Coleman would all you know, because he likes the bigger receivers who catches the ball well. Keon Coleman would also uh uh fit that mold as well. All right, final question, and I have no idea what this guy's referring to, so I'm just going to throw it at you and hope I get a laugh out of you. Uh, this one, at L. Lofton 06. Is that Tony Pauline on the ESPN clip where Jet fans of the draft were upset they dra- they passed on Warren Sapp? That was my that was my better-looking brother. <laughs> All right, Tony, oh, final By the way, just, 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 just for the record, uh, just I know what he's talking about. <clears throat> uh, back then, I was not a Warren Sapp guy. I was a J.J. Stokes guy, as a lot of people were, as the San Francisco 49ers were, who quickly made the move up to get J.J. Stokes. Really? You like J.J. Stokes, Stokes, huh? Oh, I loved him. I thought he was uh, Al Toon Part 2, and he, he never panned out to be that. Tony, good stuff, my friend. We'll talk to you next week when we do defense. Look forward to it, John. For Tony Pauline, I'm John Schmuck. Thanks for joining us on this a little elongated episode of Draft Season. We want to get all our rankings and comments on these players in. And don't forget, it was all brought to you by Moody's. Decode risk, unlock opportunity. Visit Moody's.com to learn more. For Tony Pauline from Sports Kita, I am John Schmuck. We'll see you next time on Draft Season.